Uh, good evening. Um, I'm uh, joined by two colleagues as well, so Paul Hogarth, Chief Exec, and at the back of the room we have our Chief Investment Officer, Lothar, if you'd like to take a bow, and our Finance Director, so if there's any tricky questions on numbers, Paul Edwards at the back of the room as well. Um, yes, if I could take you on a little journey then, please, if I may, uh, and just looking at my first slide, it's really just looking at the group itself, so Tatton Asset Management PLC, as Hannah said, you, we are, we're heading towards three years on, on AIM, our anniversaries uh, in July. We had a fantastic launch. Um, we were oversubscribed two and a half times, which was nice. And the share price has sort of followed um, our numbers as we've, we, as we've gone about our business. But just to let you know about the two separate divisions, um, the main growth uh, position and the one where I believe most people have invested into the business is the investment management piece. And that's where we are a discretionary fund manager, but we, we actually only manage assets on UK platforms. So platforms such as Transact or Nucleus or, or platforms like that. Um, we're platform only, so effectively we have nothing where we don't pick up the phones dealing with clients as other, other traditional discretionary managers do. So we um, have come into the market to specifically manage assets on platform for IFAs and we've done it at a price which I would call inexpensive. Sometimes we, we say use the word cheap but that obviously cheapens everything that we do so I'd say we're inexpensive. But very importantly the price that we manage assets for is in response to the IFAs. So the IFAs have told us what they want. Um, they no longer want to manage assets for their clients. They see it as being overly complicated, full of compliance burdens, and we've now seen Woodford, and we've also seen the M&G property funds, etc., where it's very, very difficult for an IFA to manage clients' assets and keep moving that asset around and make sure that client maintains its attitude to risk. So every client that visits an IFA goes through a fact-finding process and an attitude to risk questionnaire and then they're put into a number and then we do portfolios around that number and the idea is to make sure that client does not fall outside of its chosen attitude to risk because obviously portfolios move with time. So we have been called uh, a disturber, we are actually bringing a lower price to the marketplace but we have been rewarded with that and we've seen our assets grow from virtually nothing to 7 billion of assets under management. We've grown around about a billion pounds of new money per annum, uh, which obviously is, is a really good statement to make. On the right-hand side, we've got our membership division, which has two parts. It has Paradigm Consulting, which is an IFA support services business. Probably simp um, Simply Biz would be something you could see as a competitor to uh, Paradigm Consulting in, in, in the uh, listed world. We give compliance services to those IFAs, but very importantly, that gives us the DNA of understanding exactly what that IFA is after and what is keeping him awake at night. So we get tremendous feedback from them, and that's where the concept in the investment management division came from, because they were basically saying, we've got all these assets on platforms, but we don't want to manage the money anymore. Can you assist and give us a cost-effective route? And then we have a mortgage club, which is a little bit like MAB, but we do not have responsibility for uh, the, effectively the authorization. So we're not an appointed representative business. Everything we have is for directly authorized IFA. So we don't have that, that uh, compliance risk there. So membership on one side, tax and investment piece on the other. If I can move swiftly on, I can show you how our financial progress has gone post IPO. So I was always told right from the word go from Zeus, you've really got to make sure you do your numbers. Don't overpromise. certainly don't under deliver. I'm proud to say that so far so good and we've actually done all the numbers that has been expected of us. You can see the, the cargo growth in revenue, adjusted profit, our margin improving all the time. We've got good operational gearing within the business and our earnings per share going up as well. And our bragging slide is this one really, which shows the steady hockey curve of how those assets have come in over those years. So when we floated, uh, we were around about four, 4.5 billion of assets. We're now sitting over seven. 
and our estimated or expected profitability for this year will be around, around about 9 million. And when we floated, we were 4.5. So moving swiftly on, I'm going to ignore this next slide. I'm going to jump straight to the size of the market. I take it everybody understands the IFA market and how it operates. They're doing very, very well. They've not been affected by robo. Um, you're probably reading about certain robo businesses actually not making it, not getting the assets under management. Um, the bank assurers, of course, have disappeared out of the marketplace. And IFA's main problem is how do they deal with all of the clients that they're getting? They're not short of clients. <coughs> And their biggest complaint right now is we need more qualified advisors and more qualified power planners to deal with all of the clients who are getting through the door. Yes, there is a savings gap. We all appreciate that. And there are clients who can't afford to have an IFA service them. And therefore, they're having to do their DIY stuff. So Hargreaves Lansdowne, AJ Bell in places. But if you look at the IFA sector, IFAs love platforms. They're using platforms probably around about 85% of their business goes on to a, a platform such as Transact or Nucleus uh, as we know them. And the reason for that is it's so much more easy for that IFA practice to administer all of their clients. If they utilize one platform in particular, all the clients are sitting on that platform. They can see them on the platform themselves. They know exactly where they're invested. And very importantly, they can receive their advisor agreed remuneration direct from the client by taking it from the platform with obviously the client's permission. So they get paid from the platform straight to their bank accounts. The size of the market, believe it or not, there is five or there are 500 billion pounds worth of assets sitting on advisor led platforms. And that is expected to grow to a trillion by 2023. So that's our marketplace. That's how big that market is for us. Because as I said to you before, we're not dealing with custody. We're not competing with the traditional discretionary fund managers. We only want to be a discretionary fund manager on platform only. And then if we move across to the second circle, what we know is of that 500 billion, 50 billion, just short of 50 billion has made it into our world. So that's with our competitors as well as ourselves. As you can see, we've got seven of the 48.1. And that 48.1 has doubled over the last 12 months. 12 to 15 months, that number has gone from 24 to 48. At the bottom, we've got all the number of IFA businesses that are out there. There are 13,667 businesses. And of that, 5,500 are directly authorised, which is our sweet spot. And we have now got 522 firms who are feeding us business on a daily basis weekly basis into our fund management position. And just to back up my comment about them being in root health, their revenue is up again and their profitability is up. And that's because they've streamlined their businesses. They've decided that they can't be all things to all men. They're going to be financial planners, cash flow managers, fulfill clients objectives, but not actually do the investment management. So looking at it now, we can see from some of the industry data that we've got that a lot of firms are now deciding to outsource and we can see that effectively you know more and more are likely to do that as well so we've got a big educational piece going around the IFA sector. We believe that each IFA firm has around about 40 million per firm in that 495. They've probably got another 40 million that's outside the platform world probably in old products which we can't touch just yet. But that 40 million that sits there is probably what they have on average. So just moving to the size of the prize, if we actually can see how well we've worked with our paradigm firms, because we obviously have known them for longer, we've worked very closely with them. And of that 7 billion, 66% has come from the paradigm firms who are obviously in our IFA support services business. When we floated, the main reason to float was profile. That profile has enabled us to take the Tatton investment management piece out to IFAs who are not paradigm firms and get them to start to utilize us. And I'm proud to say that we now have more non-paradigm firms supporting us than we have paradigm firms. And we've done that in that three-year period. So if you take that penetration level, we say each firm's got 40 million. 
how well have we done with the paradigm firms? Well, over the period that we've worked with them, we've now got 25.3 million of their 40 that's now within our fund management capability. With the non-paradigm firms, because obviously we've been working with them for a, a, a lesser time, we've actually only got 7 million of their 40 to come and work with us so far. And if we were to get to the same penetration level with those new firms that have joined us, as we have done with the paradigm firms, then you could see that we'd have another 18.3 to come through, which would add another 6.2 billion of assets onto our position. So we could go from 7 to 13.2 by getting rid of our sales force, not recruiting any more IFA businesses and just working with the ones that we've got. Now that would be crazy and I'm not, we're not doing that. We are going to continue to drive and get more and more firms to come and work with us. But I'm just trying to depict where we are with everything. And this interesting little bullet point at the bottom is Tenet. And Tenet are basically an IFA services business, an IFA support services business, a competitor to our paradigm consulting business. And as you do when you talk to your industry peers, we're talking to them about the problems that our IFAs have had within paradigm. And we said to them, your IFAs must be having the same issue. And it obviously turned out to be the case that they were because they decided that they needed a solution as well. So they've adopted advisory model portfolios where the IFAs are making all the changes themselves. They're writing to all their clients once a quarter with research that's been done by Old Broad Street, which is obviously now Morningstar, and that goes out once a quarter, and then they have to wait for the client's permission to make that change. It's actually worse for Tenet because Tenet run so many appointed representatives, so they leave the rules and set the rules out for the appointed representatives, but they're responsible for any errors and omissions of their ARs, and they couldn't police how well their ARs were doing in chasing the client for that authorization. So they had no idea how much those portfolios had drifted away from where they should be within that client's attitude to risk. So we uh, had fantastic meetings about two years ago. We sat through and went through the whole piece. And they came back and said, Paul, we've got some good news for you. Um, we think you're absolutely right. We, we do need to do something about this. Um, but the bad news is um, because we're owned by three life companies, they're owned by Aviva, Standard Life, and Aegon, we're going to have to put you through a full tender process and you'll just have to join in with all the household names. So we had to join in with Bruins, Brooks McDonald, Morningstar, you name it. We got down to the last two, which I was delighted with, until I found out who we were up against. And we are up against Morningstar. And last time I looked, Morningstar were absolutely global and had been around an awful long time. We actually beat them and won the mandate. So not only did we actually get the mandate from a competitor, which I think is very, very big. But also, secondly, we beat somebody like Morningstar, who are already providing the model portfolio service. And they're now being given notice by Tenet, and we've now picked up that mandate. So now we're going around talking to all of their 474 firms and getting them to put assets onto our platform. And we've now had 200 million from them already. So we're, we're building that up quite quickly. And we've got 40 firms actually producing business for us from the Tenet group. So now I've got three pools. I've got my original paradigm pool, which continues to grow. I've got the tenant pool, and then we've got all of the other IFA businesses that we are educating as we go along. So turning to some research from Platforum, and this is a research document that comes out once a year. This is vital to us. This basically tells us from Platforum exactly what size of assets are on these platforms and where it's all going. And now we're picking up some stats to say that 51% of advisors now realize that they need to outsource the fund management position. They do not want to have that risk on their doorstep anymore. They don't feel that they're capable of doing that. But only so far, if you do my maths, only 12% has actually made it into our world. So where is it sitting? Where's the rest of the asset sitting? Sitting in two places, still sitting in their own advisory model portfolios where they've still got all of those issues of going back to the client to make that change. And that is just so slow. And also now, under Mifid 2, it's a full piece of advice. So every time they want to move from one fund manager to another, they have to go through as if this is a brand new start for that client. 
you have to do cost and benefit analysis and write out reams and reams and reams of paper to the client to get their client's signature and then go on to the platform to make the change. And then funnily enough, there's still 21% or a fifth of the assets sitting on these platforms are still in multi-manager, multi-asset funds. And I think the regulator would have a field day with an IFA if they went out and saw that the IFA had placed all of their clients on the platform with a platform charge and then bought one line of stock. And that line of stock was a multi-manager, multi-asset fund, which cost something like 1.5% or 150 basis points. And when we did a presentation earlier on today, we were asked, what is the total cost of advice? If you add in what the IFA takes, what the fund manager takes, what the platform takes, depending on whether you are passive portfolios or active portfolios, you're anything from 1.3 to 1.8%, 130 bips to 180 bips. And we feel that we have a job to do here. We need to protect that IFA so he can continue to maintain as much margin as he can by bringing the price of the platform down and bringing the price of the fund management down. And we can do that by working away and obviously building that asset base. We can bring the price of investing down. So if we just have a quick look at our competition, there's some household names there. I'm sorry it's a wee bit small, but you should be able to pick it up. If not, we'll certainly get packs to you. Um, you can see that we're at 15 basis points. The vast majority of the competition are anything from 24 to 30 to 36. Our 15 bips includes VAT. Um, and there, there's obviously includes VAT when you go from the different levels. And some, some have, um, for example, Bruin Dolphins, 24 or 36. Uh, 24 is for their passive range and 36 is for their active range. We just have a flat 15 right the way across the board. So we're agnostic about what that IFA decides to do and what is the right style that he thinks that client needs. Does he want a passive style? Does he want an active? Or we've even got a core or a hybrid in the middle that reduces the price by, by basically having 50% invested in, in passive and 50% in active. So we're going back a wee bit in history, I'm afraid. So the last platform uh, report was uh, finished on the 31st of March. So we were showing 6.1 billion. So you can see we're the largest, we're the fastest growing. Our next competition would be Vestra and Bruins. And then you drop down to people like Brooks McDonald at 70, you know, three quarters of a billion, not even made it to a billion yet. And I think that brings a big question into the room. And that is, if they've watched us grow and grow and grow as we have done over the last seven years, why hasn't somebody actually said, actually, I'll go and do it at the same price? And we believe it's sort of like an easy jet BA conundrum that's going on here because these firms have all got custody on the other side and they're all wanting to sell that custody because that's got a greater margin. The margin could be 80 to 100 basis points. If they come down and compete with us in price, they're making that chasm between what they do for DFM MPS and what they do in traditional discretion for management larger. And that could mean that they cannibalize their existing book. So we are disturbing. We are really getting the IFA to understand the differences and for them to understand that running your own model portfolios is not the right way. And that's the real sweet spot. And hopefully we will take assets from others as we go along. So the number of advisor firms that we have now, last time we were in the city was 522. We will update in June. Um, but we were 522 and not the 460 that's on there, but this is again from the platform report. And you can see Bruins have got 1,700 IFA businesses supporting them. And if we go back to the chart, you can see with 1,700 firms, they've only got to 3.2 billion it, and they've been around a lot longer than we have. So if I can build that number from 460, which is now 522, higher and higher, we get those tenant firms linking in, the asset base should come through quite nicely. So just looking at the investments, and we've got Lotar, if there are any technical questions that I can't answer, we thought we'd just explain to you and show you the difference in prices of the funds as well. So in the packs, you'll see the OCF of the underlying funds from low risk to high risk, uh, and you can see that we come in 
it was 15 basis points and you can see where we are obviously beating everything that's out there. Now there is one number there, 18 basis points, which is AJ Bell. And AJ Bell have actually got their own fund management expertise. It sits only on their platform. They don't allow any other discretionary fund manager to be on their platform. We're hoping that they're going to revisit that soon. So that 18 basis points in, as, uh, includes VAT, so it's 15 plus of that. And they are desperately trying to grow assets within their platform. Their platform is obviously doing very well, but they want to get into the fund management piece as well. But I put that in so you can see basically what we're trying to do. And the idea is to make sure if we keep that OCF down, that makes, that makes the IFA's take more secure. But they know, as everybody else knows, the pressure from the FCA and others is to bring the total cost of investing down over time. And we're happy to be part of that. And then I thought what, what might be interesting if you could see the split of the assets between all of the different um, portfolios that we operate. We have 29 different portfolios out there for the IFA to choose. The IFA is responsible for pick, choosing the suitable portfolio and all we do is actually manage that portfolio once they've chosen. As I said to you, we don't have any client contact. We don't have any back office or custody because everything sits on the platforms. We're agnostic of which platform the IFA wants to use and we sit on 14 of the UK's leading um, platforms that are out there. And the, if there's a business case to go into another one, we'll do that as well. So we look to extend the number of platforms. But you can see we've got 42% still inactive, 17% um, in our pure tracker, and then our hybrid, which is actually attracting a lot of assets at the moment, is 37%. So obviously half of that is passive and half of that is active. And then we've got Tatten Ethical. So we have ESG portfolios and we've extended our ESG fund range into a full range of portfolios. And we are seeing significant demand for ESG uh, portfolios now moving forward. We've actually doubled the amount of assets over the last 12 months from 1.15 to 2.3%. Um, so that is definitely one to watch this space. And of course, the big thing is you, you don't just want to be the best priced out there, you've got to give the investment returns. And critical to this is also service. But when you look at the investment returns, our team, obviously led by Lotar, the whole approach is to not go to shoot the lights out. All we want to do is just give solid, con you know, consistent investment returns that just are similar to our peer group and not look to be absolutely crazy, but just be there and be there constantly. Uh, and that's how we'll build up those assets. So I think that is probably it for me, apart from one quick look at everything we've done post flotation has been organic. We've had one tiny little acquisition of a suite of funds from the tenant group, which was 132 million, but that 7 billion has come from pure organic growth. And I'll leave you with a tenant story. The reason, the real reason that they chose us over Morningstar is they knew we would work hard and we would roll our sleeves up and get a hold of those IFAs and get them to convert across to what um, Tenet wanted them to do and what we want them to do. So we're going to concentrate on that. We'll do more and more organic growth. Um, we will look at M&A activity. If something comes across our desk that we really like or gets us into another group of IFAs perhaps or maybe gets us into another platform where we could give fund management experience to, then we'd look to do that as well. So I'm not ruling M&A activity out, but everything has been so far build, build, build organically. And we've still got that pot of cash that we raised when we floated back in 17. Our, um, our policy on dividends is 70%. So we are um, issuing 70% of our profitability out in dividends. And we have done that consistently and look to continue to do that. Thank <laughs> you.